You're listening to the Trinity Podcast. We are a multi-site church in the Chicago area whose mission is to help you look, live, and love more like Jesus. Welcome back to the Trinity Podcast. This is another midweek episode as we are moving through our series, Walking with the King, where we are looking at the earliest biography that we have of Jesus' life. That's the Gospel of Mark. And obviously we don't have time on the weekends to hit every part of this narrative. So we're taking our midweek episodes to look at some of the passages that we don't get to talk about on Sunday. And uh, back in the studio with me is Pastor Paul from our Kimberly Way location. Paul was here for our last midweek episode and we're just gonna pick up the conversation where we left off uh, starting in Mark chapter one, verse 40. Yeah, the, the last episode, uh, last little snippet of this very long chapter, this yes. full chapter. Yep. So one of the things that kind of, we, we get like three, we're going to kind of look at three little encounters um, in this episode. We're going to be looking at chapter one, verses 40 to 45. Uh, then we're going to look at chapter two, uh, verses um, one to 12. And then chapter three, or sorry, still chapter two, uh, but verses <laughs> 13 all the way to 22. Mm. So these kind of, there's these like three encounters with three different people, but there is kind of a thematic thread which goes through all of them. So let's let's just tackle uh, chapter one, verses 40 to 45. This is the end of the first chapter of Mark, which as we saw in our last midweek episode, there was a, there's already a lot. Yeah. But here in each one of these episodes, we see some of the same things that we saw in chapter one. We see Jesus calling people mm. and we see Jesus healing people. Mm. But in these episodes, the calling and the healing starts to expand. We get like a little bit more mm. than what we got in those quicker snapshots. So Paul, let's just take a look at, at 40 through 45. What it's this episode where Jesus um, actually um, heals a man with leprosy. Mm. What's the new thing though? Mm. that we see in this particular healing incident that we didn't get before. Yeah. Well, we see Jesus doing something that he didn't, quote unquote, like need to do, but something that he chooses to do. Uh, again, thinking about Jesus as someone who restores that Jesus was very aware of uh, all the things that were broken with um, this, this leper that comes to him, that this was someone who not only had the physical uh, disease, but there was kind of the, the social... Um, the social distance, the social outcast aspect of his life. Um, and of course, Jesus is aware of all of that. And so as Jesus goes to, to heal him, he not only um, speaks and, and heals this man, but as he does so, he, he reaches out and, and touches him. And uh, with such a contagious disease as leprosy, where this is someone, we don't know how many years uh, this, this person had dealt with leprosy, but it could have been a long time, could have been years, decades. And Jesus, this is the first contact, the first human contact that he has is, um, is with Jesus. And so Jesus choosing to do this again, shows him that uh, whatever kept you away, uh, I've taken care of it. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever made you an outcast, I have now um, you know, redeemed you and restored you from that. And so a really powerful uh, kind of seen here with with Jesus and this and this leper when you pay attention to those details. Yeah. I think that is one of the things that really jumped out to me about this episode because earlier in chapter 1 one of the things that we see is Jesus authority um where he'll say something and then it will immediately happen. Um, one of the things I've, I like to do when I'm like reading through Mark is I'll highlight where Jesus will like issue a command in like royal blue. And then when it actually happens, I'll like highlight it in light blue. And it's so funny in Mark's gospel, those two things happen almost instantaneously. Yeah. Like he says it and it happens. And so we know Jesus could heal this guy simply by saying, be clean. Right. He could have done it from a distance. He could have done it from a distance. Fine. The guy yeah. could have been walking down like a block away. Jesus could have been like, dude, you're okay. You're, you're, okay. Healed. you're healed. But he chooses to touch him. Yeah. Which in the ancient world, you know, you didn't touch a person with leprosy. That would have made you unclean. Mm. So not only is there that aspect of it, but I loved how you said it. Like, this is a guy who had been ostracized from a society. I mean, no human contact. Mm -hmm. And yet one of the things Jesus does in his healing of him is he doesn't just give him physical healing. Mm. He gives him almost that like social, emotional healing yeah. of touching him, yeah. which is really a very stunning act. Yes. And shows how just how that's just as important. Uh, 
something that Jesus sees as a need. And you know, it's interesting too, you know, this leper uh, <clears throat> kind of initiates the interaction. And so this leper knew about Jesus. And I'm just wondering, how did he know, like Jesus' reputation already preceded him. And you assume that people within the town, people living normal everyday lives would, are, were already aware of him. But the fact that someone so outcast knew about, about, about Jesus, I mean, I, I can imagine the, the eagerness, the excitement that this leper would have of like, okay, here's someone who can actually heal. And the fact that he even heard about Jesus, like had he watched from a distance Jesus heal? Had he, you know, had word gotten around and people were talking about it? I mean, uh, so I just, uh, again, put myself in the, that leper's shoes of um, the fact that he initiated it showed such an act of, of faith that he'd heard about Jesus, but now he really wants to, to know Jesus and encounter him personally. And I think, um, yeah, that, that faith, that courage is, I don't know, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really noteworthy, I think. Yeah, I've often wondered like what was happening with that. Like, how did he know? Like, yeah. Was he lurking by the roads and overheard mm. crowds talking about mm. this guy? Was he from a distance, you know, yeah, watching seeing. things? And you just don't know, but the, there's just this, there's this urgency to him coming. And there's also this incredible confidence. I just love how he yeah. says, like, if you will, you can make me clean. Mm. And for Jesus to say so directly, I, I will, like, I, I do want to make you clean. So be clean. Yeah. And then he, and then there we go, like dark blue, light blue. Mm -hmm. And he was made clean. Yep. Um, and just a, this beautiful kind of interaction mm. um, there. I think the other thing that we see for the first time here is in verse 41, where it says moved with pity. Mm. Up to this point, we have not gotten a glimpse into the inner life of Jesus. Mm. You know, you could have looked at all of chapter one and be like, well, it's a publicity stunt. You, yeah. know, you get a big crowd. We're like, just doing it because it's yeah. the right thing. That's nothing more. Yeah. But this is the first time we actually get a glimpse into his heart. Yeah. Uh, first time in Mark's gospel. Mm. And um, and he says he's moved with pity, mm. which... Uh, but you and I know that's that's a that's a very bizarre Greek word. Yes, it's a rich uh, a rich word. <laughs> it's a rich word, which uh, every English translator tries to tries to translate correctly and struggles with. It's um, uh, splagnizo might means to be stirred in his guts. Yeah, <laughs> which I, I love for a translation just to go for it. Just say he was stirred in his guts. So he's <laughs> but it's not indigestion. <laughs> You're right. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's this deep it's this deep inner. Um, turmoil. It's mm. this idea that, that this feeling of compassion that he has for this man goes to the very center of his being. Yeah. And so it, sometimes it's translated moved with pity. Other times it's translated um, feeling great compassion. Mm. Um, some translations even say indignant, mm. which is such a weird word. Right. That could easily be misunderstood. Yeah. That like he's angry with the person, but yeah. it, that's not what he's indignant at. He's indignant at the disease and yeah. what it's done to this person's mm -hmm. life. And so because of that compassion, he wants to make them whole. Yes. So again, it's another healing. Yep. But we get more. More is revealed about Jesus mm -hmm. uh, through it. Yeah. I mean, we see, we as Christians, we of course say and believe Jesus is fully human and like, but here's, and here's another great example of like, we see that human, that human nature of Jesus, like really shining through. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love too, and how you pointed this out um, for us during a devotion of um, the the exchange of places. That, yeah, that, talk about that, that some place. more. Yeah, so of course the leper at the start of the story is outside of the city, outcast, and Jesus was inside. And um, through this healing and this encounter, they switch places a little bit. I mean, Jesus now tells them you can go to the priest, so he's going into the heart of uh, the community again. So he goes in, but then Jesus it says. He could no longer openly enter a town, but he was out in desolate places. Um, and that was due a lot to the, the popularity and everything. But again, Jesus was, in a way, almost willing to exchange and trade places with the leper that uh, as he went about his ministry that was totally focused on other people, made him a little too popular that he needed to be outcast. But now this leper, through this healing, got to be brought in again. And so a, a beautiful reflection of uh, the gospel and what we believe kind of the implications in the message of the cross that Jesus ultimately took, took our place, you know, gave his life so we could have life. Uh, so we already get hints of that right here. It's so powerful. Yeah. It is interesting how Mark gives us these little foreshadowings of what Jesus ministry will ultimately result in. Mm. Um, you know, on Ash Wednesday, we talked about that scene at his baptism and the anointing. And it says the heavens were torn open mm. and the word, you know, verb schizo 
it's the only, there's only one other place that verb is used in Mark's gospel, and it's when the curtain in the temple is torn in two when Jesus is crucified. Mm. So it's almost this idea of this is what Jesus came to do, is give his life to open heaven yeah. for us. So you get that little foreshadowing, but it's very subtle. Right, very subtle. Here we get a similar one, right? It's I, I love that Mark, in, Mark, who does not include a lot of details, seems that like this detail is important, though. Yeah. He could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And where do we find Jesus at the end of, almost the end of the gospel is crucified outside the city. Yeah. Out in a desolate place. Mm taking this, the place of those who actually deserved to be there. Yes. And so here again, the unclean guy who couldn't go into the city is now in the community. Mm. And the clean person who probably should be welcomed in is out in desolate mm. places. Yeah. So you get the little reversal kind of motif there that's just very subtle, but it's there Right. Um, in, in Mark's gospel. So just really fascinating. It is. Uh, it's a look at that. Now, I do want to move to, to chapter two with this, this story with the paralytic. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Go, this is go. one of my favorite stories uh, okay. of Jesus. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, uh, a number of reasons. I mean, of course, this is where Jesus is inside someone's house. It was so crowded. And then when the man who's paralyzed is lowered through uh, a hole in the roof that his friends you know, cut out. And, um, but I think one of the things I like about this, this story is uh, even just with the friends, uh, their role in bringing this, this person to Jesus, I mean, by now, of course, Jesus, yeah, his popularity has exploded. And uh, these friends know that Jesus has the ability to heal. And they're so, people are so desperate to, to get to Jesus, yeah, that they will um, tear a hole in someone else's roof uh, in order to, <laughs> to, order to, to get some room made for him. Um, I think we joked about this in one of our devotions that like, what would the, the would this insurance claim be an act of God yeah. claim? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How do you like, they, it's like Torah. There's the one time you really get to, you know, without a doubt, you got to check that box. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I don't know. I love, I, I did a funeral some time ago where uh, there was a, someone who was brought to church often by uh, a number of friends and you know, at the funeral, being able to say like, you all got to live this out a little bit of like, being the friends, bringing someone, you know, your friend to Jesus. Um, but it, in the gospel, it just shows how, again, how popular Jesus was, how people knew the things that Jesus could do. Um, but here again, Jesus is totally in control of the situation. Uh, even though there's so much going on, I mean, someone's being lowered through the roof, but he really takes this opportunity uh, to reveal yet another thing about himself and what his kingdom is and the kind of power and authority that he has. Where first, he... <laughs> He heals or he does something that no one expected. I mean, everyone thought, okay, here's a paralytic. Of course, the healing that Jesus is going to provide is a physical healing. But the first thing that Jesus chooses to say and do is to forgive his sins. And it kind of starts this, this whole conversation. So I think, again, it's so interesting to see how Jesus, through all these, these encounters, always kind of remains in the driver's seat. And he is you know, very intentionally choosing how to reveal things about himself um, and kind of this this kingdom and this restoration that he can bring. And I do think that that's, that is kind of the new thing that we see here is we've seen physical healing, mm -hmm. but now we're seeing a spiritual healing. Yeah. Like we've seen Jesus, he'll do, he, he's brought spiritual freedom mm. in his exorcisms. Right. He's brought physical healing in some of the, you know, you know, the, with the paralytic, with Simon's mother and so on and so forth. Here we actually get a, a spiritual healing in the sense of like, your sins, which keep you from God, mm. those are forgiven. Yeah, Those are not going to be a barrier to me, mm. which is really funny that a story involving a physical barrier mm. becomes a story about removing a spiritual barrier. Spiritual. Yep. And then he ties it to physical healing. So mm. again, that holistic theme of yeah. he doesn't just come to heal you physically. He comes to heal you spiritually. He doesn't just come to spiritually heal you. He comes to physically, physically. heal you. It's, yeah. it's the Both. whole thing. Yes just that kind of holistic nature of the kingdom um, coming out again. Yeah. Another, just another piece. Yeah. And I think too, the, another new thing we see is uh, with the popularity comes some opposition and some skepticism. And I think this is really the first place where we see uh, people being vocally, uh, maybe vocally challenging Jesus. And especially with a claim like uh, forgiving sins, that was a total disruption to uh, the way that um, especially the, the religious leaders who are, you know, in many ways in the, the business of <laughs> forgiving sins, I guess, um, you know, the matters of God, that Jesus right here is making a huge claim. And they are 
then trying to calm the task and accuse him of, of blaspheming and everything. But uh, then again, Jesus' actions speak for themselves. And he puts the question back on them, like, which, which is harder to do, to forgive someone's sins or to heal them of paralysis? And, you know, of course, Jesus then just does both. And so it's, it's great where uh, even as Jesus faces this, this opposition with this growing popularity, um, that he, again, just remaining in, in control of the situation and, and wanting to uh, reveal that, yes, he does have the authority to do these things. And yes, you should be actually, you know, if you had kind of the right heart about this, you should be um, overjoyed that <laughs> here's someone with this authority who's choosing to use it for the good of others. Yeah. Um, but, but they I mean, just don't they get miss it. the point. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that is another new thing that's kind of added here is we start to see how the crowds actually become a problem. Mm. The crowds initially keep the paralytic and his friends from coming yeah. to Jesus. In the crowds are people who aren't quite sold on him. Mm. And actually this tension with the crowds is something that grows throughout Mark's gospel. On the one hand, like I think modern day people are like, oh, look, more people must be a better situation. Yeah. Not necessarily. There is this theme that we kind of see of like, you, you have to come out of the crowd mm. and get closer to Jesus. Yeah. So you can't just go with the crowd. Right. Um, and, and sure enough, here we have a man being brought out of the crowd and being brought to Jesus. And that's where, mm. where his work is done. So right. again, more of a hint here, but it's, a, it's something that grows through the narrative. The crowds actually start to become a problem. Yeah. They're not only less, a, they were a mixed bag, but then more and more, they're just actually, yeah. In the way. More just a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, let's, let's get to kind of like the last little section yeah. here. Um, we see Jesus now calling somebody. We've seen him call people before. Yep. He's called other disciples. Here he calls, uh, you know, Levi, son of Alphaeus, uh, who's a tax collector. Yes. So Another surprising choice yes. uh, for different reasons. Yeah, so yeah. What, what, what is new about that? What's surprising about that? Yes, well, instead of just maybe average, ordinary fishermen who were probably loyal to, you know, the nation of Israel uh, in the eyes of all, you know, just normal every day, uh, here's someone who has kind of in this role as a tax collector, um, and now that's a, a very unpopular uh, role to have, where it was one of prestige in, in terms of the kind of power you could have with the Romans, but it seemed, it's kind of seen as someone who's a turncoat and not well respected or appreciated by um, the people of Israel. And so again, Jesus chooses someone that no one would expect to follow a Jewish rabbi. He chooses someone who has questionable loyalty to, you know, the people of God. Yeah, he's, I mean, Levi's a sellout. He yeah. sold out his people to a pagan nation mm -hmm. who had conquered them, essentially. And yep. yet Jesus is like, you. And then we see that Jesus actually then goes to his house and parties with his other tax collector friends, which I think is really shocking. Yes. And sure enough, there's people who are mad about it. You know, you get the, uh, the scribes of the Pharisees come saying, what are you doing? Mm. Eating with sinners and tax collectors. Um, and again, a really shocking response. Jesus yeah. says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Yeah. Like, let's just unpack that for just a moment. What, I mean, it's, it sounds shocking. I think it still remains shocking today. What would you say, you know, as you read that, how do you receive that? What's, what remains shocking about that even, mm -hmm. even today? Yeah. Well, I think when we think about being a part of church and being a Christian, uh, those who are Christians, the perception of Christians, like generally I think those are the, the good people, the better people, um, at least people who hopefully, you know, want to be good and, and healthy, so to speak. And yet Jesus is saying, well, the people that I really came for and the ones I want to call are not the, the perfect, righteous, never did anything wrong kind of people, but those who are, are sinners and those who, are not perfect, uh, and those who are in need of healing, uh, of, you know, various kinds of healing. And so I think, again, that can, it's a really helpful reminder, uh, not only for, for Christians, but for non-Christians, that those who would count themselves out, well, here's Jesus saying, no, actually, I did come for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and those who are maybe already in, so to speak, we have to remember that, yeah, but we'll never stop needing Jesus to heal us and forgive us. Um, no matter how much our lives may improve, um, we still need Jesus to be our, our healer and our physician. Uh, so just showing how, yeah, this is, Jesus is especially for um, those who may 
discount themselves. And I think that's a really, um, a really big comfort, encouragement. That's how I hear it. Yeah, and I think especially the idea that he's a physician, it's just, it's people who can't heal themselves. Mm. So part of being in Jesus' kingdom is recognizing I can't fix myself. Mm. Yeah. I do need him. Yeah. Um, and as long as you think you can fix yourself and that it's by your merits that you are accepted or get into heaven or whatever it is, earn God's favor, he's like, you don't get it. No. You don't understand what my kingdom is all about. You have to recognize how desperately you need me. And in many ways, you know, Levi does. And yeah. these other characters in these stories that we read, they do. The leper comes to him. Mm. You know, the, the paralytic is brought to him. Mm. Levi is the one who's called to follow him. Mm. Um, and I think that flies in the face of what many people think about religion these mm. days. That's what religion is. It's a self-help program. It's a self-improvement program. Mm. Uh, it's for the, the people who have strong will, good character. You know, I work hard. I'm super smart or insightful and therefore I'm in. Yes, you, know, you learn to you learn the rules and the idea is to play by the rules so that you know life will be better and improve and whatever it is. Yeah, and that Jesus' whole kingdom is exactly the opposite of that. It's recognizing you can't fix yourself. Yeah. That you de- do need someone. And yet I love the fact that he says, and this is the reason I came. Um, you know, not we won't get into this too much, but eighteen to twenty two, mm. they continue to ask him, Why aren't you making them follow rules? Mm. Why aren't you making them fast? And he's like, Because right. I came to welcome them in mm. to have a party. Yeah. This is the new thing that I'm doing. Yes. It's not about doing in order to belong. Mm. It's about belonging. Yeah. You know, I come to give you belonging. And I've heard, you know, churches will have that idea of like, you know, you uh you believe, behave, then you'll belong. Mm. Jesus is like, No, you belong. Yes. So that you might believe. believe. And then it'll change and, your life. Yeah, live, and you'll behave. <laughs> you live according to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's belonging totally. that he comes to give first. Well, it was so ironic that they, I think a lot of those religious leaders wanted, the reason that they cared so much about following all the rules and the laws was so that God would visit them and God would be with them and sort of have his favor. And yet, here's God right He's in front of there. them. They're looking <laughs> him in the eyes and their rules and their following that gets in the way. It totally blinds them to well, here's God, here's the thing you always wanted. Um, and yet, yeah, those who were honest about their their need for, for help were the ones that saw it and received it. So as we kind of like wrap up this episode with these three different encounters, back to Mark's central question, mm. what kind of king is Jesus? Mm. What do we get from just these encounters at the end of chapter one and this portion of chapter two? Yeah, well, I do think sort of that friend of outcasts idea um, there's so many people that Jesus could have chosen to really focus on and spend his time with, and he's choosing to spend it with outcasts and outsiders and those who had counted themselves out, uh, whether did it by themselves or others counted them out, um, that Jesus goes to them and, of course, does bring restoration, whatever they need, um, and calls them to a new life in many ways. But, yeah, Jesus reaching out to those he wouldn't expect is the kind of king that that we see. Uh, that's my take. Yeah. What about you? Oh, nope. I would agree with that. I think that's the one thread that ties these three stories together is you have people who would have been overlooked and outcast, and yet they're the very ones that Jesus, in his compassion, is moved to reach. Mm. And uh, again, I just take immense comfort knowing that that's the kind of king that he is. Yeah. That he comes for the least and the lost and welcomes them into the party. Mm. So yeah, I think that's a great note uh, to end on is yeah. Jesus is a Jesus is a king who is a friend of outcasts. So mm. Paul, thank you for taking time on the podcast. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And uh, of course, we want to welcome you to continue to tune in with us as we release episodes on the weekend and also these midweek episodes as we're moving through our series in Mark's gospel, Walking with the King. Thank you so much for joining us on the Trinity Podcast. We hope this week's message encouraged you to consider the claims of Jesus in a new way, and we would love to have you join us for worship on the weekend. To find a location near you, visit www.tlc4u.org.